Good afternoon, everyone. Yesterday, the legislature voted to override six of my vetoes. As you remember, after the last week of a chaotic end of the session, where they passed 70 bills in three days, I talked about how we were going to review each bill and weigh the good versus the bad when deciding whether to sign the bill, go let it go without signature, or veto it. And with each veto, I included a letter explaining my concerns and described a path forward where we got, where neither of us got uh, everything we wanted, but we each gave a little. Unfortunately, what has become typical of the legislature is their unwillingness to meet me in the middle to come to a reasonable compromise. Yesterday, the legislature proved once again they don't need to consider my perspective or proposals. And that's what's sad, sad about this, is their strategy only hurts everyday Vermonters, because it's Vermonters who pay the price. When I travel around the state and talk to people, so many are worried about how expensive it is to live here, and they wonder how they're going to make ends meet. It's them who will pay a higher property tax while schools struggle to put forward reasonable budget budgets. It's them who will pay more to turn the lights on or heat their homes because of the renewable energy standard and clean heat standard. It's our rural communities who will continue to suffer in the future due to the expansion of Act 250 and will have fewer tools to help them with housing and making life more affordable. And it's Vermonters who are already paying 20% more at the DMV and will face a new payroll tax starting July 1 after all we've been through with being crushed by inflation. So as many will frame this as a loss for me and a win for the legislature, the reality is it's a major loss for Vermont taxpayers, workers, and families. For six months, the legislature has known about this property tax increase facing Vermonters. We warned them in our December 1st letter that there was an 18% property tax increase heading their way. But instead of sounding the alarm, they said I was fear-mongering, and the pro tem promised to get it down to one and a half, maybe 2%. Instead, Vermonters will face a historic double-digit property tax increase this year of about 14 percent. And yesterday, they were even declaring victory when they said they had gotten the property tax rate down more than 33 percent. But what they failed to mention was that 33 percent reduction is compared to the projected 18 percent increase. That's like raising the costs of a loaf of bread by 60 percent and then having a 20 percent off bake sale. They also failed to mention they raised taxes and fees in other areas to give you that 33 percent off. And because nothing was done to address the structural problems, we'll see, see the same thing play out again in about six months. From my first day in office, <clears throat> I've been clear about my priorities make Vermont more affordable, protect the most vulnerable, and grow the economy. My team has spent this entire legislative session trying to keep costs down for Vermonters while working to make housing more affordable and more available, improving our education system for kids and taxpayers, and revitalizing communities so we can keep and attract the workers we desperately need. It's clear this legislature led by the supermajority, has little interest in compromise or taking a moderate approach on almost any issue. As I've said, I feel obligated to be the voice of Vermonters, and I'm sorry that it was not enough this year. At this point, we simply need more balance in Montpelier and lawmakers who will put people and communities over their political politics. So with that, Open up to questions. Just to clarify, you said the pro tem had promised at one point <clears throat> to get this down to one to two percent. When did that conversation happen? Um, I think he did it on a in an interview. Okay. I think it was on 
CX, I believe maybe Mark Johnson on 802 something. Something you can research. So let's imagine a scenario where the balance in the legislature does not change next year. In that event, how do you go about reestablishing some influence over the policies that are coming out of the state house? You know, it's, it's frustrating and uh, difficult. I tried to lay out that vision in the state of the state, the budget address, ask them to meet me in the middle. I didn't ask them to cross the aisle, ask them to meet me in the middle. And it seemed to fall on deaf ears. Um, we met regularly. Um, I, we had press conferences uh, talking about what we saw that was coming. Uh, that frustrated them, and they said that I was I was getting ahead of uh, the legislature, but when it all was said and done, they did exactly what I was warning Vermonters they would do. And that was with the, with the housing in particular, the conservation bill that came along with it, and Act 250 reform that hurt rural communities. So it's, we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, if I'm there, if they're there, and um, we'll, we'll try and find a different approach. But I, I just want to be honest with them about what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing. And uh, I think most, most Vermonters would agree with me. The criticism in recent years, and I'm hearing the same thing from some in Democratic leadership too this year, especially with the property tax issue, is that your t you and your team weren't always involved in the conversation. When you were, there was like a, with a proposal like from Commissioner Bolio or the one that we saw last week that relied on, on deficit spending or, or spending down reserves, that is. Um, what do you make of, of, of that concern that the, the criticism that, that you and your team were, were absent from the negotiating table and oh, showed up? couldn't be like, further from the truth. I mean, we, we were actively uh, pursuing um, some sort of a, a deal where we could get structural reform. We've been doing that for eight years. I mean, can, we can give you a whole list of a litany of, uh, of approaches that we've tried over the years. Again, falling on deaf ears, as though they, they weren't believing, weren't listening to what was going on, what was happening. Uh, fewer students in our schools. The, the costs increasing, and it was clear uh, that we needed to take make some ma major changes, um, but they weren't willing to do that. So I thought this year uh, that they may see that uh, as being, um, when we issued the December 1 letter, as being um, a signal, a warning, that things weren't good and that they would take action. Um, but they didn't. They doubled down, actually, and and um, continue to raise the cost of living with increased taxes and fees across the board. So, again, I, I don't know what to make of it, um, but we're doing our part. I'm only one voice, and with a supermajority, they really don't have to listen, as they've proven time and time again. This time last year, after they overrode um, five vetoes, you said something along the lines of, I feel like the governor should have a role to play in state government. And with the supermajority, you mentioned it's tough at times. How would you compare your feeling and the administration's feeling this year compared to this time last year? Um, equally as frustrated. Uh, I believe that, you know, maybe even gotten a little bit worse. Uh, the supermajority really. Um, I think the power has gotten to their head. Um, I think they're being a bit arrogant in some respects uh, to the needs of Vermonters and what Vermonters are actually seeing and feeling and, and uh, living each and every day. They can't afford much more. And when we propose, you know, for instance, uh, with the yield bill uh, to use some of the reserves some of the surplus to buy down the rates with structural reform as well, intertwined with that, because this is a, an emergency for taxpayers. And um, behind closed doors, some of them have said that Vermonters actually need 
a wake-up call because it's out of their control. It's a local issue, and they should be voting down their school school board um, um, budgets. And I just think it's a wrong approach. We don't need to punish Vermonters anymore. I think they get it. They're looking for us, to us, for guidance. Um, I don't know if you mentioned the Overdose Prevention Center bill yet. What do you make of that back and forth yesterday that ultimately ended with Senator Westman changing his vote? Yeah, I, <clears throat> we had known um, right along that Senator Westman was going to, going to vote to override. Um, so I think he truly, truly made a mistake in his vote. Um, I'm surprised he didn't catch it earlier, like as soon as he said it. And um, I think that could have been reversed at that point if you had, before you declared the results of the, of the vote. I think that they would have given consideration to that at that point. But I take him at his word that he just made a mistake. And he had told us that he was going to, to vote to override. Um, did you um, have any conversation with newly appointed Senator Julo about the Overdose Prevention Center bill prior to, to the I, vote? I did not. Um, when I interviewed him, um, I told him that there was no litmus test here. I wasn't asking for anything. I thought his experience on the school board and some of what he um, learned growing up in Grand Isle County uh, was enough, and I thought um, he would make those decisions on his own. So um, I didn't have any conversations with him. What about data privacy? What, did you make any calls or have any conversations in the Senate about data privacy over the weekend? Not over the weekend, no. Before the weekend, like Friday? Me, myself? No. But your team? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> or I, maybe I should say your administration. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you yes, your administration. Yeah, we were checking in uh, with legislators to, to figure out where they were going to be. You know, nobody likes surprises. Um, so we were doing all we could um, to at least get them the information and what we're hearing and what we're hearing from you know, it's a, every day we receive more and more calls from small businesses throughout the state. And um, that was increasing, not decreasing. And it wasn't just the, the larger ones, the Orvises of the world and so forth. It was some of the smaller vendors. So we just wanted to make sure they were paying attention to that, especially because there was another approach that we could take. The Connecticut model being one that I think yeah, universally everyone uh, could live with. And then you could build upon that. Um, New Hampshire went with the with the Connecticut model. Maryland is similar. Having a Northeast coalition of uh, like-minded uh, data privacy language, I think, would be helpful. It doesn't look like it should be a national issue. It should, Congress should be doing something, um, but it doesn't appear they're going to be able to agree on that. So, um, I think this regional approach makes a lot of sense. It sounds like you're saying, on one hand, the Vermonters, I'm the guy that has your back on affordability in this state. I'm the guy that's going to fight for lower taxes. I'm the guy that's going to fight against things like the increases at the DMV. I'm the guy that's going to fight against, uh, you know, regulations that are going to squeeze businesses. Um, and on the other hand, you're saying to them, but I don't really have the power in this context to meaningfully advance my affordability agenda and learn how you think they're supposed to reconcile those two things. Well, I think they saw my approach in the first six years. We were fairly successful in keeping taxes from being increased, fees from being increased, uh, affordability was front and center, and uh, we were able to make um, some gains in that area. It was just been the last two years with a super, super majority. Um, we'd, we'd faced one before, but it was smaller numbers. Uh, this was... Um, by far the most difficult uh, because of the numbers. So there wasn't that veto threat. They didn't have to take it seriously because they knew they could override it, they could hold everybody together, and they did. Um, again, putting, I guess, party before their constituents. But now they do have that super, super majority, as you call it. Um, what good is your position 
on these issues if you don't have the ability to execute on your mission? Yeah, well, the executive branch should have a say in this. And in, uh, in other times, I don't know of I don't know of any other governor who's experiencing what I'm experiencing in terms of this type of supermajority, but um, when you look at history, um, there was, I think, more respect for the executive branch, and it seems as though they're learning well from D.C. Um, D.C. is uh, dysfunctional. Um, it's all about uh, partisan politics, and it's all about uh, leverage and who gets what and making sure that you have the majority and they've learned well. It's turning in the same thing here in, in Vermont, which is unfortunate. All right, we'll go to the phones. Uh, Keith Whitcomb, Rutland Herald. Keith, are you there? Vermont Business Magazine. Thank you, Amanda. Governor, I was thinking about uh, what's transpired not only this year, the last couple of years. And looking back historically to um, things like Act 200 and civil unions being passed, you know, you look at civil unions, it flipped the legislature, just that one thing. But a lot of things like don't, you know, seem like a big deal at the time, and then over time they, they aren't. And, Obviously, the property tax is going to have a big impact on everybody, but is there another of, of these issues right now, is there another that you can see that's going to have a really long-term effect? Well, again, I, you know, I, I look, at, um, look at housing and our demographics, um, and I think it's all intertwined with, uh, with my fear about uh, the future of Vermont. And I talked, uh, I spoke about this in, when I was first elected, uh, remember 631. Well, 631 is still is still hampering us today. Six fewer workers in the workforce every day. You know, three, three fewer kids in our schools uh, every day. And um, and that is exactly what we're facing, what we're struggling with, which is why we need more housing. And that's why I, I said we need much more housing than much more help uh, with housing than we received from the legislature this year. Um, S311 was a was a great start. We we talked about that at the beginning of the session. We had tripartisan support on that piece of legislation, and that should have been a no-brainer. That should have been that should have been passed if you wanted to intertwine it with the um, with a conservation Act 250 proposal. So be it. Um, but um, but they only took a portion of S311, not enough of it, and that would have made it more palatable because we could. Um, again, uh, attack the demographic issue, more housing, uh, attack the, the uh, worker shortage with more housing, and um, this isn't going to do it. This isn't going to suffice. Um, so we're going to be struggling for a while, um, I'm afraid, without some more relief. Uh, thank you, Governor. Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. Thank you. Sorry for uh, my delay in getting on. Uh, Governor, I noticed that a lot of the mainstream media of that is read or listened to in Vermont use the repeated phrase that in different forms that H687 was a bill that seeks to balance promoting housing growth and environmental conservation. But the reading of the bill and the discussions that took place really don't show where they promoted housing at all. And I wondered if you and your team have tried to ask some of these media to, to, take, to go back and look at this from a different perspective than the one that is provided by the quotes that come out of the State House. Well, I think balance is, um, is accurate, um, but it's not an even balance. Um, it's out of balance, as a matter of fact. They took, uh, again, I, I think what they really wanted to pass was what they did. And, and that was the Conservation Act 250 uh, provisions in the bill. And they got that across the finish line. And they, they did it by sprinkling in just a little bit of housing, just enough to gain a few more votes. Um, 
and they aren't, I, I don't think, they're being sincere about the dangers uh, to rural Vermont. I think Rep. Williams, um, in her, if you if you saw or, or listened uh, to what she had to say uh, in her explanation of her vote, I think it was very powerful, very telling, and real. And that's the way Vermonters in the rural sections of Vermont feel. Now, <clears throat> if you're if you live in Burlington, a population center, Essex, um, Barrie, Montpelier, Rutland, you, you would think this was this was fine. This works. But if you're living somewhere in the Northeast Kingdom or somewhere in in, in the middle part of the state um, where there isn't that much population, um, this is going to make this is going to make their economies worse in the future. Make it more difficult. Uh, to build the housing they desperately need too, if they want to revitalize their economic centers. And they do, but they need some help from us in order to do that. It was as if they wanted to take and preserve <clears throat> the rural parts of the state. But the folks in the rural parts of the state want to live, and uh, they'd like to prosper a little bit too. And we're just you know, holding them hostage in some respects in doing so. Thank you. No other questions. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. All right, back to the room. Governor, back to the housing for a second. Given some of the bigger picture housing challenges, labor, lumber, lending, high interest rates, the jobs and demand is also in the more urban parts of the state, even if we, we went forward with S311, would, would it make a difference or, or how much of a difference maybe do you think it would make? Well, it would have made much, a, a lot more, um, it would be much more significant than what we received. Um, even then, I mean, that, to be perfectly frank, S311 wasn't enough from my standpoint. We would have liked to have seen more in that bill, but it was a compromise amongst you know many parties, tripartisan support. And um, again, looking back, uh, that, was, uh, that wasn't even taken up, that S311 approach, that tripartisan bill wasn't even taken up in the House, sat on the wall. It was passed out of committee in the Senate and stalled out in um, Senate Natural Resources, which is what I predicted it would do at the beginning of the session. So um, do I think do I think it would have been uh, everything to everyone? No. Would it have solved our housing problem? No. But it would have been uh, enough, enough to put a dent in it. And we need to continue to put dents in this uh, in order to move forward. And I don't think the what we received, again, what we received in this, this bill that they overrode um, my veto on, um, 687 will be helpful for a short period of time, but when you look at the parameters, I think, I think we'd ask for some of the relief for until at least 2029. I think the Senate had 2028, uh, and then they, uh, they settled on 2027. Doesn't give you a whole lot of time to get anything done. So we'd ask, that was one of the things we were asking for, stretch it back out to 2029 and include some of those, you know, for tax stabilization. I think it was uh, Grand Isle that didn't, Essex didn't, and, and uh, the Bennington that didn't. So give them tax stabilization too. Why exclude three counties in Vermont? And why the legislators in those, in those areas, those counties, didn't fight for that is beyond me. In terms of some of the meetings that we've been talking about, like with the menu of options for um, the reduction in the tax burden a couple of weeks ago, why wait until after the legislative session was over to do those meetings? Okay. Like until the videos. We, we, everything that we across. everything we we proposed after the legislature uh, adjourned were things that we had asked for during the session. So. 
it's a misnomer. It's misleading uh, for people to think that we didn't propose anything during the session. Uh, we had our tax commissioner in, in finance, ways and means, any place uh, where we could um, have an audience. We were, we were talking about our proposal. We met with legislators as well uh, from the House and the Senate and, uh, and were able to, we thought, make some gains. Again, not everything we wanted. Uh, and for 24 hours, the, the House actually took that, that information that we all somewhat agreed, the, the direction we thought uh, Vermont ought to go, um, and, uh, and had a press briefing, I think, on uh, what, they, what they proposed, which is something that we agreed to as well, for about 24 hours. And then they got tremendous pushback. I mean, this is, none of this is easy. And I'm sure, um, and they took it off the table and said, we need a study. So this study that's in there is going to be a fairly long period of time. And I would say it'll be, by the time you study it, come up with a, something in bill form, get it across the finish line, you know, it'd be two years um, before we see any relief. So we have something to look forward to. Can you also give us an update as to where your administration is with the 10-year telecom plan? I understand we're coming up uh, July, I, I believe it is. There's some dates in the statute. What are you hoping to get out of this? I'm wondering if Commissioner Tierney is on. She is not. Um, I admittedly am not up to date on that at this point in time. I'm happy to try and get some information to you, though. Uh, back to safe injection sites, what are some of the impacts you were hoping to avoid by vetoing that, and, and what do you expect the results to be now that it will go through? Well, again, getting just from a practical standpoint, um, once again, I think it takes resources, money, away from the rural areas of the state that rely on prevention, uh, treatment, recovery, they, you know, three legs of the stool that, that we, I think we all agree on, and uh, the money will go to Burlington uh, with a safe injection site that isn't going to be set up for a year or two and cost millions of dollars. So we, Burlington gets it once again, gets some help, some relief, but uh, the rural areas of the state are not going to get those resources. So. We talk about saving lives. I don't know how many lives we'll, we would save with more prevention, more treatment, more recovery, uh, but, um, but those resources are going to Burlington. Is there any, this may not be true at all, but I'm just curious, is there any sort of executive action or something that the administration could take to prevent an overdose prevention center from going into I don't think so. Somehow, no. Or? no, I mean, I. Yeah, I did all I could with the with the veto, and uh, we came close, but um, but it's going to become law, and um, we'll just have to, as the executive branch, we'll have to do our part to follow the law. Governor, you talk about the need for more balance. You said that you were actively trying to recruit more moderate, pragmatic folks. Are you going to be actively campaigning with? potential Democratic and or Republican candidates as well like out in the community? When we when we get to through the primaries, yeah, I, I would say that I would be more than happy uh, to help any of those moderate centrists of either party get elected. How big a role will this dynamic we've been talking about just now in terms of, I mean, even like with the number of vetoes this year play in that campaign messaging that considering or that you would plan to do? Um, you know, I think I've said this before. Um, I would rather not veto anything. I would rather find compromise along the way and not have to veto, not go through all the drama associated with vetoes. That's not what I'm aiming for. I'm not out for any records. I'm, I just want what's right for Vermonters. I, I want to help Vermont survive. And there are so many, particularly, particularly the working class, who are 
suffering today with property taxes, inflation, all kinds of other taxes that are being imposed upon them. And um, we can do better. I, I know we can, uh, but we need the right people in place. We need the right legislators in place that will have an open mind and will actually listen, listen to those who elected him, them so that um, so we don't end up in this, in this place in the future. Like I said, if I, got, if I didn't have to issue a single veto ever again, I'd be happy. It's also uh, wicked hot this week. Um, I mean, like all over the Northeast, but you know, what, what is the state doing to, I'm thinking, you know, homeless Vermonters, I'm thinking elderly Vermonters, like what, what is the state doing to make sure that like, people are checked in yeah. on and that type of thing? Um, yeah, I'll have um, our Director of Emergency Management, Eric Foran, talk about this a little bit because we've been working with the Department of Health and, uh, and the Department of Public Safety, uh, the Emergency Management and so forth to get uh, messages out. But I, I really uh, do would ask Vermonters uh, to, to check in on their, their neighbors, their elderly neighbors in particular, and, uh, and make sure you know, your, your animals as well, your, your pets, um, don't, don't leave them in the car, and, and your kids. I mean, make sure you pay attention to this because, it, as you said, it's, um, it's, very, it's going to be very hot, very humid, and uh, it's not going to take much uh, to cause um, a catastrophic event. So um, just pay attention, be aware. Eric? Yes, Governor, and thanks. I'd like to echo you as well. And uh, we're trying to push that Vermonters are there to support other Vermonters. So making sure that you check on your neighbors, making sure that you. It's slightly <laughs> too hot to freeze. <laughs> uh, we'll get back to Eric here shortly. Maybe we'll take another question, then we'll get back to him. Um, I just had one to circle back on yeah. data privacy. Um, I know you mentioned getting outreach from both large businesses, like you said, the Orvises, and also small businesses too. Were there any other like key stakeholders that came to you or to the administration that really influenced your thinking on that and led you to veto it? I more the businesses uh, than anything else, and, and again, not just the large ones, the small ones. Um, so, yeah, that was that was where we were focusing on. But there were also other associations that uh, came and said, you know, there was one piece or another they didn't like about it, the private right of action uh, they thought was going to be detrimental uh, in the long term to uh, in other areas as well. Um, so, um, again, it's unfortunate it got to where it is uh, because there was an alternative. And sometimes uh, you have to, to walk before you run, and uh, you can build upon success in one area. And it seemed as though there was universal agreement uh, that uh, the Connecticut model would work for Vermont. And I think we should have taken that and then built upon it. By association, do you mean like a chamber of commerce? Or yeah, like, chamber, or, yeah. What does that mean? Chamber of Commerce, uh, Bankers Association, you know, others uh, who, who said, you know, the private right of action was an issue. What, what about from like big tech? I mean, that was the other criticism that I think most of us have heard is that <clears throat> there's potentially like national big tech, I hate to use that word, but like lobbying organizations. Yeah. Did you hear anything from national organizations? I'm sure we did, but I didn't read anything from them. I didn't receive any personal outreach from them. so. No, it was, for me, it was all the small businesses in any business in Vermont that got my attention. I don't think we're going to get Eric back. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much.